is actually in the sanctuary of the meeting house. And um, Sharon is going to ring the bell and light the chalice for us. And the words for our chalice lighting are from Kazuhaga. If we carry intergenerational trauma, and we do, then we also carry intergenerational wisdom. It's in our gene. It's in our DNA. If we carry intergenerational trauma, and we do, then we also must carry intergenerational wisdom. It's in our genes, in our DNA. Hear these words of welcome. We bid you welcome who come with weary spirits seeking rest, who come with troubles that are too much with you. We bid you welcome who come with anticipation in your step, who come proud and joyous. We bid you welcome who enter this place as an explorer who come to learn and to see. We bid you welcome who enter this place as a homecoming, who have found here space for your spirit, who have found with these people a family. Whoever you are, whatever you are, wherever you are on your journey and on this planet, we bid you welcome to our time of worship. I'm going to uh, go ahead and do the kids' story. And Deb, if you would put up the affirmation, we'll, we'll do that after the kids' story, and then we'll be ready when we get there. So today is a very special day. Today, tomorrow, yesterday, right around now, is a very special day because it is Lunasa. And I am wearing this special cowsick that was given to me by my Aunt Loretta. And there's lots of things in this. It's a cross, but it's a special kind of cross. It's a Celtic cross because the Celtic cross has the ring around it. But it's more than just a cross, it's a calendar. And this is the calendar. At the top is the winter solstice. Here's the spring equinox. Here's the summer solstice. Here's the fall equinox, right back around the winter solstice. So the sun is in the middle, and it's an image of our planet traveling around the sun. It's an image of us traveling around God at the center. 
So where are we on this calendar? We are at a very, very special point. We're right here. We're right here. We're at the halfway point between the summer solstice and the fall equinox. So these, sometimes they're called quarter holidays. They're the, the quarters between the main ones. So it's called sometimes Lamas, this holiday, August 1st. Some say it's celebrated after the full moon, after August 1st, which the full moon's tomorrow. So we are in this like three day window of super special time. It is called Lunasa and Luch was the God of the sun. He was the God of music. So here we are traveling around this. And this is a Celtic cross. And it's also, it can you see, it's sort of the body of a woman. See her, she's got her arms outstretched. She's got a long dress on. So it's multiple things at once. And that is just so Celtic, because the, in, in, in the Celtic worldview, there's not just one way. There's always multiple ways to say things and see things. And everything has more than one meaning in the Celtic way. So as we celebrate Lunasa, it's the first of the harvest celebrations. So here, I decided to have the worship service, I'm outside, to connect with the land, to connect with the earth, to honor the sun, in the ancient Celtic religion, the god Blue. So we'll say a little bit more about Lunas later in the service. Let's start now with our affirmation. The words are in the chat box, I think. Are they there? Yeah. Join me. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer to dwell together in peace, to serve the needs of all beings to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other and with the source of our being. In the, in the opening medley that Julaine played for us, the first piece that she played was Tura Lura Lura. And it just made me smile. My grandmother, after whom I was named, Mary Ellen Kennedy, she used to sing that. She'd be bustling around the kitchen, making tea and sitting with her social tea biscuits, singing Tura Lura Lura. And it's a lullaby. It's a lullaby. So I invite you to just sort of breathe in that energy of the lullaby, Laura, Laura, Laura. And let yourself relax. And if you're not out in nature, take in this beauty. And let yourself come into a place of ease and meditation. And if it helps you, focus on your breath. The mind has a tendency to wander all around. It sometimes needs an anchor. The breath can be just such a perfect. So we are just going to lullaby ourselves with a little quiet meditation and breathe. Enjoy some silence together.
Thank you for sharing that time of silence and meditation. As I said, in looking at the robe that I'm wearing, this image, in the Celtic worldview, the Irish worldview, there's always multiple ways of understanding and seeing things. I've heard it called quantum Celtic, the, the, uh, the Irish viewpoint. If we could see the world with Celtic eyes, it wouldn't just be trees, they'd be alive. They'd be smiling, they'd be talking to us, waving to us, alive with us. If we could connect in that way, and sometimes we do, you have those moments, you know you do. Like Moses in the burning bush, it was alive, it was talking. So one of, Lynn is gonna share a song with us that really brings to life that aspect of the Celtic worldview. This is a song, the Seal Woman song, because in the Celtic view, an animal isn't just an animal, it's a being, it's a person. A song isn't just a song, it's a myth, it's a story, it's an invitation. And the words aren't just words, they're an invocation, they're a resonance. They're a healing remedy. So let yourself and your imagination be stressed by Lynn's song and let your heart be healed with this beautiful story. Thanks, Lynn. Sure. I want to share with you some of my adventures. I had the great, great blessing of going to Ireland a year and a half ago. It was just exactly a year and a half ago, because I was there. At this point, I was there at Imbolc, the, the halfway point between the, the winter solstice and the spring equinox, the holiday called Imbolc. We call it Groundhog's Day, February 2nd. So, so exactly, the sun went around one and a half times since, since my trip to Ireland. So I wanna share with you some stories and I, the way I'm gonna share it is in the form of what, what is it? I don't know, a song, a ballad, an epic that I wrote about my adventures. And to, uh, for you to understand, I just need to explain a few little things. One is my name. My name is, most of you know me as Mer Melon, but my birth name is Mary Ellen. If you can say with an Irish accent, you can call me that. Otherwise, it's Melon. Mary Ellen. So I'm named after my grandmother. And Mary Ellen Kennedy. And I'm named also after my godmother, Mary Ellen Mara. So that will come up in this ballad I will sing to you. And I also want to show you a photo here. This is a ship that I boarded when I was there. And I, I write about this. He's not supposed to be on there. Oops, come on, go the other way. There we go. Um, the ship is called the Dunbury. And it was... There was a ship called the Dunrody, which was a famine ship. These were the, the vessels that carried one and a half million Irish people to America. I'm sorry, it's, it's, I'm, I'm not very skilled at this yet. There we go. So the, the Dunbrody was a beautiful wooden vessel. And not too long ago, some people rebuilt. They built a new one. And it is now, it sits in the harbor and on board, it's a museum. There's, there's a museum on the, on the quay and, and about the whole experience of the Irish who emigrated, about their suffering, about some of the reasons why they left, how dire it was, 
the poverty that they experienced. They were evicted, many of them. This is a family facing eviction. And the source of it all was, of course, the potato crop. The potato crop that failed 1947 for another about a decade. And uh, the, the, the original disaster capitalist, you've probably heard about disaster capitalism. It's a wonderful book by Naomi Klein. Um, the people who are parasites, who, who come in on people's disasters and find a way to make money of it. Well, the original um, disaster capitalist was this fellow whose name is Boycott. And the word we know in English, Boycott, comes from him. He's a guy who started preying on the people who were being evicted and taking over their houses. Well, the, the, the Irish didn't submit, he was English, of course. The Irish didn't submit to this. They organized something called the Land League and they boycotted, boycott. They gathered around and said, no, no, you've, you've evicted this people. We won't support you, we won't harvest. So the, the people in that, in that village, they just refused to do the harvest because of how he was treating the poor people. And the English sent in thousands of soldiers and workers to harvest this for Mr. Boycott to save this little crop and to show the Irish a thing or two. But, but ultimately they were successful because everyone knows the word boycott. Some of you are involved in boycotts right now and or have been in your life. So that's just a little background of this ballad that I will sing to you. Need a little water first. As my airplane is landing in Dublin, and I see the surf at half head rumbling, my Irish star heart starts bubbling. I'm home, I'm home. As I'm boarding the Kilkenny Red Bus, the panoramic front seat is a must. All is so new as I drink in the view. I feel with joy that I will bust. At the Dublin stop by the bus kiki, a woman boards and sits right by me. She starts to chat as she takes off her hat. When we're both on our way to Kilkenny, parallels are of our lives are a plenty. Both raised Catholic and found it condemn me. Of siblings and family, we both many. We share stories of nuns, masses, and priests. In sense, uniforms and holy feasts. It's like home. It's like home. We're smiling and feeling camaraderie. Then she turns and she says, quite casually. By the way, my name's Mary Kennedy. Well, my head jerks with great rapidity. My jaw drops with great fluidity. I say, how can that possibly be? Me and you are names. Your name is the same as me. The first person I meet in Ireland, her name is Mary Kennedy. I'm home, I'm home. With goosebumps all over our extremities, we share a twilight zone remedy. We marvel at our shared identity. We are each and we're both Mary Kennedy. Our hearts beat more than coincidentally. We're home, we're home. I visit my new friends, Mike and Fran. 
Though not native, they dearly love this land. They hail from other lands where order it is grand. Here their can continental hearts are contented. Their home, their home. As we're waiting for their dear friend, old Kate, you can't count on her, she's always late. If she says, do you have six, it'll be after eight. Kate, they say, with continental display, living Irish time is her rhythm. We love her so, but it makes us no schism. And me, I'm thinking, Kate's flow is sublime. What better way could be there to live on Irish time? My Irish heart is chiming. I'm home, I'm home. The Stony Ford pub, it is grandy. And with the tin whistle, Mike is quite handy. His jam mace with banjo and bow run. With fiddle, the music, it goes on. The beers and the jokes, they are flowing. To the reels and the jig, my, and the jigs, my toes go in. My Irish heart is, it is beating. I'm home, I'm home. As we're bored in the coffin ship on Brody, my heart, it is already for Bodie. The living space is cramped and quite grody. In the late 1840s, it had started. With crop failure, they were all broken hearted. Over a million people were starved to death. In pain and desperation, they took their last breath. Of those who were survived, many were evicted. The Irish hearts were conflicted. Where's home? Where's home? Another one and a half million departed. Desperate many sailed for the land's life uncharted. Leaving families and all they'd not see again. Homes, land trees, women, children, and men. My Irish forebearers were leaving their home, their home. So as we boarded the ship, I felt horrible. I saw the conditions were deplorable. I imagined their fear with little food and no gear. Their Irish hearts were breaking. No home, no home. Two or three months out on the ocean, cramped, hungry, and always in motion. Before they arrived, half the people had died. Their Irish hearts were grieving. Where's home? Where's home? When on the other side they had landed, basic needs and care were shorthanded. Their Irish hearts were trampled. What home? What home? A destination where I wanted to go is my great grandpa's, <coughs> my great grandpa's county of Wicklow. As Mike is driving, the higher we go, we're creeping along, go, go in, go in real slow. The gap it is closed, you falling thick snow. Crossing the mountain today is no go. My Irish heart is blowing. I'm home, I'm home. I forgot to say, the Lincoln Gap's right there. I often can't get through. <laughs> I meant to say that as a precursor. I was right at home, couldn't get through on the Wicklow Gap, just like right here. In the church of Newtown, Mount Kennedy, I sit and I ponder with serenity, the life of my great grandpa, James Kennedy. They say the banshees were, were, were frightening to him. Did they call him Jameis or was it just Jim? 
Did he sit here before he departed? For America and a life all uncharted. Was he brave? Was he bold? Did he miss here when he was old? Was his Irish heart always wondering, where's home? Where's home? In Dublin at Tran Trinity College, I gawk at the Kells Book of Knowledge, ornate with gazelles, blue birds, birds and, and bluebells, a more beautiful tome I have never beheld. My Irish heart was swelling. I'm home. I'm home. As we tre trek along the wild oak cliff, cliff walk, walk, overhead the gulls and the hawks do squawk. With Shane as my guide, the whole day opens wide. He told tales of the yacht Asgard gun running for the 1916 Easter uprising. Their Irish hearts were fighting for their home, their home. The outpost landscape is beguiling and charming. Shane tells me tales of the two of Dathan and the megalith tomb, it's as big as a room. Jane sees the high and the gleam in my eye. He says with his Irish heart glowing, you're home, Melon, you've come home. At the hostel on the river Liffey, with 50 teens from Mississippi, they're partying and all looking spiffy. My prospect for sleep's mighty iffy. So I gaze on that beautiful Liffy, and my angst is gone in a jiffy. My Irish heart is wilting, is lilting. I'm home, I'm home. As the mates on the train, tr train car do jostle, their jokes and their quips are colossal. Then with the start, I'm right back with my brood, where each day is always with humor and beaut, with my dozens of cousins and brothers, with all of those godfathers and mothers, with aunts and uncles and all of the others. We joked and we jested and wise, we joked and we jested and wisecracked, each one of each one a more with. Sorry, I lost it. Each one a more witty comeback. My Irish heart is laughing. I'm home, I'm home. Yes, our people were scarred by the great shame. Not proud of who they became. Their lives were snuffed out or marred by the great hunger. They fled or to America or to down under. Lest I think of myself as a victim. The epic museum paints a whole nother dictum. Our Celtic line, oh, it is so fine. We are athletes and actors and healers. We're innovators and great business dealers. We're bakers and those in need feeders. We're inventors and spiritual leaders. Across the globe with our eloquent, eloquent bent, we've created more than one president. We sing and we play, we dance and we write. Oh, the pen and our hand takes a magical flight. Our Irish hearts in the diaspora have made home, have come home. As I wander the fine streets of Dublin, I see where Parnell had his troubling. My Irish heart keeps on bobbling. I'm home, I'm home. Well, what could be what could possibly be more fulfilling with prayer and good luck and God willing than to return to that isle 
and stay there a while. I'll kiss the ground, it'll be so, so thrilling. Joy and song in my heart overfilling. And my own Irish heart fill will be trilling. I'm home. I'm home. I've never written something like that before. It's kind of fun. And I, I forgot to, to tell you a, a few other things about it. I made some references in there. Um, people call it the famine, but uh, Irish people call it the great shame or the great hunger. Because um, there was plenty of food in Ireland. The English were shipping it out to their colonies all around the world as Irish people were starving. More than a million starved in that decade from 1947 on. There was plenty of food being shipped out by the English. The great hunger, the great shame. Well, I grew up in a very Catholic environment, sort of, but not really, sort of, kind of, yes. Well, it's Celtic, it's ambiguous. I went to an, a Catholic school growing up, St. John's School in Middletown, Connecticut, across like this, is on the church itself. And I went to Mercy High School, another Catholic institution. And Judine Wren and Sharon McDonough on St. Patrick's Day would get on their outfits and do their Irish jigs for us. And we would eat cake with green icing. And my grandma, Mary Ellen Kennedy, and my uncle Bill Kennedy would come down from Hartford and spend the day, spend the evening with us in celebration of St. Patrick's Day. And I couldn't help but notice as a kid that my dad sat in the corner, not really participating in the festivities. It wasn't until many, many years later that I had a conversation with my dad where he said he grew up feeling ashamed of being Irish. He grew up feeling and my dad, dad was kind of, he was a historian. He wanted to be a social science teacher. He loved history. And he was always reading history books, but he never read anything on the Irish. He loved all the other cultures, but he felt like the Irish had done nothing in the world. Until that book by Thomas Cahill, I believe, How the Irish Saved Civilization. There was about a hundred year period where Europe was in complete conflict, wars and fighting, and there was no learning going on, things were being destroyed, the great books were being burnt and the, the copying that was done by the monks wasn't happening. But in that time, Ireland, off on an island by itself, the learning continued and the writing of books, the, the scribes continued. And Ireland in that time period was the hub of European civilization, it kept, the great texts alive. So that book, How the Irish Saved Civilization, it was a turnaround for my dad. And he went from feeling shameful of who he was to feeling, hey, wait a minute. And my dad and my mom made a trip to Ireland and they came back, I don't know if I've ever seen them so happy, it's almost like they were floating. They loved it. And my mom said, there's no way to describe what it's like being there, to walk where the ancestors had walked, to be with people where you feel that connection. She felt at home and so did my dad. So there was a really profound healing that happened, I think, for my dad, especially, who, who grew up with a lot of shame about his background to claiming the beauty of it. And I want to go back to that quote that I opened with about intergenerational trauma by Kazuhaga. If we carry intergenerational trauma, and we do, then we must also carry intergenerational wisdom. It's in our genes, it's in our DNA. Scientists now call it epigenetic, how 
trauma actually affects your genes and you pass it on to your children. So I inherited, and so did you, the traumas from our ancestors. And as we try to understand, we're in this difficult, challenging moment, Black Lives Matter, racial injustice. Those of us who are born into white bodies have a really important role to play in the healing. And the healing is the kind of thing my dad did and the kind of thing I did by going to Ireland. And I was home and witnessing the traumas when I boarded the Don Brody. Oh, I just can't even say what it was like to imagine the suffering of those people, the degradation, the desperation, which was worse, to stay and die of starvation or take the risk of leaving everything. Such courage. That's in my genes. And for my siblings who are on the call, it's in yours too. And anyone whose family went through that, it's in yours. And what the people who are studying trauma are teaching us now is this internalized trauma that's in your DNA, as Hazugaga, as he says, Kazugaga says, it's in your DNA. So if you had, your people had violence perpetrated on you, it's in you. And the thing is, there's a flip side. If you are among those who were the perpetrators of violence, it's in you too. Your ancestors witnessed these great calamities, these wars, these injustices, these inhumanities, no matter what side, at what particular moment in history you are on, the oppressor, the oppressed, it's in us. And to do this work, how is this connected with Black Lives Matter? How is this, where, what, how does this possibly make sense? This fall, we are going to be reading, and I, this is a book I really encourage everybody to, 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 to work with. It's the book, My Grandfather's Hands. And it is the author is Resma Menachem. I'll put it, I'll put it up on the screen here. I'm just getting it. Here we go. It's quite an amazing man. He's a social worker and he's African American. And he's written this book which is really profound and so helpful. My grandmother's hands, racialized trauma and the, the pathway to mending our hearts and our bodies. Because these difficult things that we have done, that our ancestors have done, that have been done to our ancestors, they reside within us. The title of this, this book, My Grandfather's Hands, it refers to the, the author, Resma Menachem, the African-American, when he was a, a little boy, he, he was looking at his grandmother's hands and they were all thick and tough and kind of big and gnarly. And he was comparing to, him, to his own and he says to his grandma, how, how can that be? <laughs> you know, what, what's with your hands? And she said, well, I started picking cotton when I was about four years old. And the trauma, I, I, don't, I don't know if you've ever picked cotton, I have not, but I've seen it, I've touched it. It's really, it's, it's, it's really harsh and pokey. It, it cuts you it, constantly, it hurts. It really hurts to pick cotton. So this little girl, Resmo's grandma, that trauma is emb embedded in her hands and in her body. Her feet are the same. So he, as a social worker, Resma has done this incredible work of understanding how racialized trauma, it's in us. And to heal, 
what we have to do, I'm not sure if it's up on your screen, is it? I'm trying to do a screen share here. There we go. Okay. There's the book. So he, he was interviewed on Krista Tibbet on June 6th. So uh, Krista Tibbet on Being with NPR. It's a really great show. On, and, and then he was interviewed again um, just a few weeks ago. So I encourage you to, to, to tune in, listen to his interview. And if you're up for it, get the book and read it. And we're going to be doing online discussions using this book this fall. In, uh, in September, October, November, somewhere in there. We'll, it, and the, the book is full of lots of exercises, really simple stuff. And it's really profound because he talks about three things, the white body, the black body, and the police body. And how the trauma enters our bodies. And unless we can metabolize it, unless we can deal with it, it's stuck there. And it creates tension. It creates disease, it creates discomfort, it creates pain, and it creates patterns of responding, unhealthy patterns of responding. So in the book, Resma talks about how do we metabolize this trauma? How do we get it out of our bodies so that we can actually live in the present moment and not live in what's happened to us, what's happened to our grandparents and great grandparents and great, 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 and what we have done what others have done to us, what has been done to our ancestors. How do we do this? Well, it's pretty cool, actually. It's really pretty cool. And one of the ways is music and singing, which is part of why I decided to uh, do, do a ballad as, as poor of a singer as I am, because it's, it, it's interesting that Irish singing, and it was one of the ways of coping with what they were dealing with. That singing opens your bodies, it loosens you up, you're bringing in air, and when you're singing with other people, you're resonating, and you're attuning your bodies to each other. So the calmness and the joy in each other's bodies enters your body through the act of singing and dancing. So singing, that's one way. Being in nature, that's another way. The trauma is in your body. When you breathe in fresh air, when you see the trees, not only see them, but commune with them, it heals you, it stabilizes you. And some of the discomfort and trauma that's in you, it's metabolized, it's let go of. And one of the great ways of dealing with trauma it's humor. Boy, that piece, that, that part of, of what I wrote in this little ballad of uh, when I was on the train and I started hearing all these, these guys, they call it the crack, you know, you know, joking, constantly joking with each other. That's how I grew up. That's how my siblings were. That's how my, uh, my extended family, the cousins were. And I, I, I was talking to a person recently and I said, people who have gone through trauma, people who are oppressed often develop an incredible sense of humor. And, and she, she caught for a moment and she said, I'm Jewish. Yeah, well, there's lots of Jewish comedians. That, that that's a way by laughing, by letting go, by loosening up. So rather than holding the trauma in you, to make light of it. And in the communal laughing, again, it's that sharing of breath, sharing of a worldview, and the sharing of a sense of community to be able to joke with somebody, you, you, got, you got to know them well enough to make a jab. It's not mean, but it's fun. So the crack, not cocaine, the crack, the wise cracking, the joking, that's a way of dealing with trauma. And another important way of dealing with trauma is to tell the story. Boy, the list of great poets and writers, writers of songs that have come out of the Celtic tradition, out of Ireland, it is so long. There's something, the magic of the pen. The difficulty, the story inside of you. Um, Maya Angelou, I think it is, says, there is no 
greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you. So writing, and if it's just for you, write in your journal. Some of us are doing different, different classes together on, um, on racialized trauma and on racism, and journal writing is a really important part of it, to write down, to record. Get it out of your body where it's stuck and it's hurting and it's disrupting and script it. And it may be just for you or it may be a beautiful piece to release eventually to the world or write a song. So these are some of the ways. It's in your body. The, genet the epigenetic trauma, it's in your body. And what I really want to remind us all of is what Kazuhaga says. If we carry intergenerational trauma, and we do, then we carry intergenerational wisdom. It's in our genes. It's in our DNA. And I just love that the museum I went to, the Epic Museum in Dublin, it looked squarely at the trauma, but it also looked at the glory and the power of the Celtic lineage. It was just so inspiring and beautiful. And I felt healed and uplifted just by spending some hours there. So I, my question for you, do you carry intergenerational trauma? Can you sense it? And if you don't know yet, sit down and do some writing. Walk in nature. Do some breathing. Listen to some music. Find where it is in you and be gentle with yourself. And certainly you carry intergenerational wisdom. I, I, I love so much of what I learned from my dad and from my mom. What they gave me. How about you? The intergenerational wisdom. What has been passed down to you? All the songs? That way of seeing? Throughout the Celtic heritage, there is a connection with spirit. God, the god Luch, as we celebrate Lunasa today. The intergenerational wisdom of, past, of the generations passing down and say, you matter. You are a child of the divine. You have that great spirit inside of you. And when you connect with that spirit, it heals you, it heals you. So what about you? What about your intergenerational wisdom? Who are the ancestors that taught you, that passed great stories and recipes and ideas and songs down to you? I invite you, take some time today or tomorrow Tomorrow's the full moon, great time to do deep work. Take some time to sit and write. And don't write just about the traumas. Write about the intergenerational wisdom and celebrate, celebrate. Celebrate your braveness to face what is wrong and what's hurting. Celebrate the beauty of who you are and who you're becoming. So this is our part, those of us who have white skin, if we don't heal our own white body trauma, we just keep perpetuating the cycle of violence. And it ends up being taken out on black bodies and on other white bodies. So this is a challenge. Read Resma's book, Resma Medicum's book. Join our discussions in the fall. Sit and write about your intergenerational trauma, cultivate your intergenerational wisdom, and become the full, beautiful, whole, healthy being that the Great Spirit intended for you to be. You have something to give. This, this tumultuous time is calling on each of us to find the answer inside and to contribute to the rebirth of humanity, and you're a part of it. You have a piece that nobody else on the entire planet has. You have a perspective to give, love to give, skills, prayer to give. And when you give it, it heals you. 
So I invite you, take this challenge. Feel your intergenerational trauma and celebrate your intergenerational wisdom. We're gonna close with that song from my grandma, Mary Ellen Kennedy. She used to sing this as she made tea and as she dipped her social teas, those little biscuits and her tea with milk. Tura Lura Lura, I'm sure my siblings who are on the call remember, can just see grandma doing this right now. So Julaine's gonna sing for us and is it in the, you can sing along. Uh, um, is it in the chat box? I'm not sure. Tura Lura Lura, it was written by James Royce Shannon, made famous by Bing Crosby. Maybe that's why my grandma sang it. Thank you, Julaine. That was beautiful. I can just see my grandma. And uh, the lullabies, they soothe the body. They're, 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 uh, they're trauma healing wisdom. So uh, sing yourself a lullaby tonight, if that will help you. If you have found community here, treasure it. If you have found challenge here, and I hope that you have, if you have found challenge here, go and sit quietly with whatever is stirring in your heart. And if you have found hope here, bring it out into our beautiful and broken world that needs you, you healed of your trauma, you connected with your generational wisdom. May it be so, blessed be. Amen.